I have no idea what happened. Rob just dropped out. We'll wait for him to come back in. <laughs> Let's see. Here he is. Okay, we're good. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> That's perfect. It's all good. This is great. Um, Rob, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really, really looking forward to this conversation, especially coming off of your weekend immersion, which I was afforded the opportunity to attend in person. It was a really incredible experience. Um, and it, it, it exceeded my expectations. I'll say that. And my expectations were pretty high. So it was, it oh, was, wow. thank it was you. pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, because there might be a lot of people who are unfamiliar with you, there's there's probably some who have seen the documentary Heal. There's probably others who are familiar with your work via attending either an in-person weekend immersion with you, doing a healing with you, or um, attending something on Zoom with you. Um, but I, I think it's important contextually just to share your your journey, starting with your childhood. So okay. we'll just we'll start there. Okay. Um, first, let me just thank you for being here. And second, as I as I talk about my journey, I want everybody to understand that every point of my life, every experience I've had, whether it may sound not so great or amazing, I'm grateful for because the experiences in my life are what taught me to do the work that I do now. And so I, I needed to have experiences that I'll talk about in a minute in order to bring me full of compassion, full of belief, full of faith and what's possible. And I, I never would have had that had I not had the life that I've had. So when I talk about things that don't sound so pleasant, they were actually huge gifts that, that, that gave me an understanding or a, a teaching or something about myself or about human beings and how we interact with each other, how we interact with ourselves. That's my life was teaching. So People ask me all the time, who, who is your teacher? You know, who, who is your master? Who did you learn from? And my answer is always the same. It's from my life. It's from my life experiences. They were the greatest teacher because nobody else could have taught me what I've been taught except me. Right. Does that make sense? So, you know, I was, I was born into a, a German Lutheran family in Nebraska. So I had Midwest you know, German Lutheran parents who were extremely religious and which is cool. I mean, I have nothing against that, except that they didn't understand me <laughs> very well, because as a child, you know, as a little toddler, I was fully clairvoyant and all those clair things. And I could see my great grandfather talking to my great grandmother behind my mother, and she would yell at me because I was making stuff up or you know, whatever, but I'm like, but I can see him. I can talk to him. And they didn't understand. And for you, it was like essentially second nature. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't anything weird. It was like, yeah, of course I see. Yeah, of you course know. I can talk to them. Well, why, why don't you talk to them? You <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, so probably by the time I was age five or six, somewhere in there, I, I started to attract animals into my path. I'd be outside and a bird would land in front of me with a broken wing or there'd be a rabbit with a hurt foot or even bigger animals, a deer and different things. And, and because I was raised in a Lutheran family, we were taught to pray. We were taught to fold our hands and ask God, say the Lord's prayer and then ask God to help, you know, whatever, ask God for forgiveness or whatever it was. And so I just automatically would respond to the, to the hurt animal by closing my eyes, folding my hands and looking up and saying, God, would you please help this rabbit? This rabbit needs your help, God, please. And, and then I would open my eyes and I would look down at the animal and I would feel this energy start to build up in my body and I would reach my hand out and the animal wouldn't move and then it would just be like electrified. It would be like flopping around <laughs> and, you know, for a few seconds. And then it just walked. It was fine. The bird would fly away. The animal would walk away. And I'm like, thank you, God. So I would run home and tell my mom that um, I just, you know, I prayed to God and God helped this rabbit. And she's like, stop telling stories. You know, you're, you're making stuff up. And I'm like, but, but anyway, so that went on for a while. And, and the more I did it, the more I, I fell out of favor with my mom because she really thought something was wrong with me. Yeah. Cause they, they sort of looked at this as out of the norm, especially within a, 
uh, you know, very strict Christian background. So, and especially coming from the Midwest, I mean, I can relate being a Midwestern boy myself that this is clearly out of the norm. And a quick, quick question though, with respect to the animals coming up to you. So do you feel that these animals just had this in, intuitive sense to, to approach you because they knew that there is this sort of healing energy flowing through you? Yeah, they're, they're actually much smarter than we are. You know, I, I watch my dog um, looking around the room when I'm doing work. I know he can see the beings that I work with. And, you know, he'll come from wherever he is because he wants to be in the energy. He'll sit by my feet. Or, you know, I used to have a cat that would, if I would have a stomach ache or a headache, would like land itself right wherever my pain was and start purring. So, I was, you know, they, they were doing sound healing on me. So, I think animals are much more intuitive than we are, and they're they're always coming from unconditional love. So they don't care. They just want us to feel better. They love us. They'll do anything for us. So yeah, animals are amazing. We I, I'm afraid we don't get, a lot of people don't give them enough credit, but I do. Yeah, I know you talk about like your dog laying around when he feels energy. I I love that. Um, yeah. And when you so when you approached your your mom and dad with these stories, of course, they like were dismissing them. But then after some time, they they sort of took what you were saying seriously to some degree, but they thought it was bad and dark and things like yeah. that, right? You know, I had I had the classic older brother who loved to blame everything on me and get me in trouble. And so he would kind of spy around, sneak around and follow me to see if I would do that thing, right? <laughs> And, you know, he would witness some of that and then he'd run home and tell mom that I was doing that thing again. And, you know, and, you know, there's a couple of things that happened that it's kind of too long to talk about, but a couple of things that happened uh, on the same day that just pushed my mom over the side. And she's like, that's enough. And the next thing I knew, I was in, in the church, you know, surrounded by the, I guess they called them elders or whatever. This is a Lutheran church, which is pretty close to Catholic. And, you know, I remember the pastor, I could say his name right now, that's how much I remember it, but um, I remember him uh, having this, some kind of a object, I don't know what it was, shaking it at me and screaming at me and screaming at my body to let the beast go, get the devil out of me, me and all that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm helping these animals and I'm praying to God and I'm doing all the things you taught me. Well, what's your problem? You know, I'm seven years old. And anyway, so they pretty much in an hour or so scared the crap out of me and convinced me that I would burn in hell if I kept doing this and which didn't make wow. sense to me. I'm like, why would I burn in hell for helping something? But mm -hmm. you know, it, at seven, there's, you don't have a lot of power and you still pretty much believe everything your parents tell you. So that was a gift. I mean, that was my first gift because, because they, they shut me down. They, they forced me to shut down all of my clairvoyance stuff, which probably would have gotten me into trouble or they could have taken me to the Ed Sullivan show and put me on TV or something as some miracle little kid. And I probably wouldn't have lived until 20. I, you know, I very easily could have turned into a dark place by, by letting it get to your head or something be yeah, like so yeah, yeah. they actually did me a favor now at the time i didn't think they did and i was in therapy for years years after that over that whole incident yeah and um and then you know when i started doing this work i realized what they the gift that they had given me they gave me the gift of having a normal a fairly normal human experience in life instead of having an abnormal experience, which I could have had, and I could have been a real jerk. I could have been, you know, somebody that was filled with ego and no compassion and just like, what's wrong with you? And, you know, I could have been like the pastor yelling at people. Yeah. And instead it, because of all my experiences, I've become, you know, very compassionate and very loving and open to anything and, and nothing. I have no judgment about anybody or anything because I understand. I've probably done it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've probably done something similar because my life was pretty crazy. And um, anyway, so that's that was the first kind of point of where I, I had a, a really hard experience, but it was a really amazing experience and, and something I'm really grateful for. When you were going through therapy after having this 
essentially what was an exorcism performed on you and, you know, your, your parents yelling at you and things like this. Was there any point in that where you began doubting yourself? What was it kind of like, of course that, that had to have felt like some form of gaslighting where it's like the, you're, they're denying your real lived experiences and your abilities and things like this. So was there a state of confusion surrounding all that? Yeah. I mean, and, um, not to get too deep in my own psychology, but you know, my, my mother was very hard on me and my older brother kept telling me I was worthless and adopted. And my, my real parents didn't want me because I was so worthless. And I, you know, I, so I bought into all this Mm -hmm. low self-esteem, low self-worth. And then the, 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 you know, beating out my, what I thought was something I was gifted with, didn't understand it. You know, I, I had a lot of, um, self-hatred and self-doubt and self, you know, I just, I just didn't understand. And I felt like I was this worthless person. And so the good part of that was though, instead of, instead of like suffering, I pushed myself and, you know, went to graduate school and did all these things and became very successful as a businessman, all the while still having this internal dialogue about you're worthless one of these days somebody's going to see through you and see what you're a charlatan and a fake and all. i mean that went on even after i started doing this work for a while i would hear this yakking and like this time they're going to they're going to expose you rob you know mm-hmm. and it took a long time to to shake that out and again when people talk to me about their experiences i'm like yeah i understand i understand how that yeah. feels right so yeah you've you've lived a what would be considered a normal life for for a long time and yeah. so 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 talk to me now about the experience of reigniting the the divine spark within you so to speak um and and coming back into these these abilities well, I understand that after, you know, after I was old enough to leave home, I, I completely disregarded uh, organized religion. I, I was angry about it. I was hurt by it. And I thought it was a bunch of BS. And I, I made no, I wasn't shy about saying that. And so my, my early, you know, my late teen life and my, the rest of my life until I was in my 50s, I would say to people that I was either an agnostic or an atheist, but I, it was not, I had no faith in anything because it didn't, it was all garbage. And, you know, I kind of dabbled in some spiritual stuff. I went to some psychics and did some different things. And I was like, I was confused by it. And, and I was confused because I hadn't remembered that I used to do stuff like that. I had, I had completely blocked what happened as a child. So and when I would have similar experiences with somebody else as an adult, it just, it, it didn't feel right. And I, I'm sure it was because of what I was told as a kid, right? So I was, I was a very materialistic, highly driven executive that was all about how much money could I make? What kind of Porsche could I buy? What kind of, how much could I spend on a watch? You know, Italian suits, crazy. That was my, you know, money was power to me. And I, and the only way I could prove my worth was to make more money. And that's the only way I would be worthy of anything. And, but yet, and still, even though I made a lot of money, I still felt empty inside and felt like I was just a clown. I was fooling myself and everybody else. And so I'm only saying that because of, you know, I went through a really not a nice divorce. Uh, after, at one point, I, I lost my two kids. And um, I was about in my 30s, 31, 32, or something like that. And and I just I took it really personally because of all my you know input that I'd had. And actually, the first I tried to kill myself back then. And there was a divine intervention of a friend of mine who was a doctor that just happened to be driving by my house and had a feeling in his stomach that you better stop by and see me. So he pulled into my house and wow. saved, saved me. Um, I'm, and I'm only sharing this because I want people to understand that I've been through it too. I'm not some, you know, Messiah or some person up. I'm as normal as anybody else. Um, and so, you know, I went through life and then um, when I was 50 years old and I had another horrendously unpleasant experience where I lost everything that I'd worked my whole life for. 
and got betrayed and all these things happened. And, you know, after that, I spent about three and a half years um, numbing myself with uh, Stolich and I vodka and uh, painkillers. Hmm. And I would, I would come out of that long, just long enough to get a consulting job or something and make enough money to pay the rent and food. But then I would slip back into that, that, that really dark place. And, you know, I tried, I tried lots of drugs to get out of it, but nothing would work. So then, and in 2003 in February, I once again decided that I, I just needed to leave. I needed to get out of this life. I just, this, I couldn't understand why my life had been the way it had been. And so I lived in Southern California where I live now. And I lived in Seal Beach, which is close by. And it was a, a Tuesday morning or something. And I just had done all this research and I, I had friends that were physicians that would give me a prescription for different things. And I had this combo figured out. And, and I actually woke up that morning really happy because I felt like I was finally gonna be free. And this is in 2003 in February. And so I, you know, took some pills and I walked down the beach. I lived about a half a block from the beach and I thought, I'm just going to sit on the beach. I love the ocean. It's a good place to go. I'll be happy here. And, and I started to get, you know, like started to kind of go into a whatever state. And all of a sudden I got really angry and just, I filled with rage. And I, I remember standing up and looking up into the sky and screaming at God. And I won't use the words that I used at that day, but they weren't nice words. Mm. <laughs> you this and you that and you this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, right? Mm. How, how dare you do this to me? I didn't ever do anything wrong. You son of a, you know, I just on and on and on, on this rant. And, and while I was doing that, my little chatterbox is going, see, you've lost it, Rob. You're crazy. You know, you just need to go because you're nuts. Yeah. They're screaming at God and you don't even believe in God. And that went on for, I don't know, a couple of minutes or something, who knows. And so I finally said something very clever, like, so God, if you have anything to say to me, you better say it now. Mm -hmm. I'm about to go. <laughs> and I heard this voice and I was like, what? And then of course this voice is going, you're still, you're hallucinating. You're making this up. This isn't real. Yeah, yeah. You're crazy. And Basically, the, the the long the short story of the long story is that I was reminded in that moment of what I did as a child. Wow! Even though I didn't remember it, I was I was told that that my my journey could be if I said yes could be that of um, a healer, but with people instead of animals. Wow! And but I had to make a decision. I had to I had to say yes or no, and I had to be all in either way. And I remember this like very compassionate voice is talking to me. And again, I, I can't prove any of this. I just remember it this way. Um, I remember this very soft, compassionate voice saying to me, "We lo you're loved either way. Hmm. You've always been loved either way. You can choose to do what you set out to do today and you'll be loved, or you can accept what we're asking you to do and you'll be loved. And there'll be no difference in the amount of love that you receive. And I, I just remember that just like I was being held in such in such love, you know. And of course this guy's going off really, like, you crazy mother. Yeah. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm in. Wow. So I had no remember it, but I didn't remember what I was in for. I really, I just, I, I took the easy way out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's interesting too, because I, I would imagine that at this point, despite saying you're in here, you are this, you know, corporate materialistic CEO of various companies that is, that is now pursuing this sort of unknown journey of remembering in a way because it's remembering an aspect of yourself that you had sort of suppressed and, and, yeah, exactly. and almost forgotten about exactly. so so what did that look like initially like what was how did you get from from that moment to now doing what you do now what was what were those steps like well they weren't they weren't easy i can tell you that yeah um, because of course all of my self-doubt self-esteem 
all of that stuff came right to the surface. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had all these, I had all this, this, um, all these feelings of, I even let myself down. I couldn't even kill myself. I mean, it was like that kind of stuff. Wow. And, you know, I had, at this point in my life, I had become such a hermit that I didn't really have any friends. And, and because I was drinking and taking drugs and acting weird, I didn't really have anybody to turn to. And one of the things I was told on the beach that day was to go to Sedona. And I knew about Sedona, but I thought that was just a crazy place. People went to, you know, sing Kumbaya or something. And, and they said, just go to Sedona that will help you. And, you know, I didn't have any money and my car was being sought after for repossession because I hadn't paid for it. And I was like, I don't want to go to Sedona, but I thought, you know, if you ask God, if he has something to say to you and you hear something, maybe you should listen. Hmm. So I, you know, after a couple of days got in my car and drove the eight hour trip over to Sedona and had no idea what I was going to do there. I had no money. I was going to stay like one day and turn around and come back. And uh, all kinds of magical, mystical things happened to me over a couple, three weeks. And, and then I started to have faith because I, I started to have things shown to me and things happened to me that were undeniable. And even though I was, and I, I said, I started to have faith. I still wasn't, I still wasn't there. I still was like, I was very curious, but I, I was, I was still like, ah, come on, this isn't real. Why would God choose me? You know, I've had this life. I haven't been you know, kind to myself, blah, 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 blah. And so I went through a lot of that and finally they told me to come back home. And so I drove back to seal beach and, um, you know, I started to, say the Lord's prayer again, just kind of like weirdly, I don't know where it came from. I just started saying it again. And then at the end of it, I would say, and God, what would you like me to do? And lots of times I was told to rest or have patience or relax or just breathe or whatever. But one day they said, um, we'd like you to step into your power by um, creating some business cards and that said, Rob, we're going healer on him with the phone number and put him up in a public place. Claim your power, claim who you are. And you have to, you know, you don't have to, but you, this is something, it's a step you should take to bring forth the remembering of who you really are. Because at this point, I still was confused, really confused. Mm. And I, I had nobody to talk to because my friends already thought I was crazy and I didn't want to lay all this stuff on them too, right? So, yeah. um so I made some cards and uh, put them up at a local health food store in uh, the area. And, um, and uh, before I even got all the way in the door in my house, my phone was ringing. Wow. And I know you were going to ask me about my very first experience. So here it comes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my phone's ringing and, you know, I'm scared to death because I put this card up and I, claimed myself as being a healer, but I didn't know what that meant. I had yeah. no idea what that meant. So this, this sort of imposter syndrome was coming back in just in oh, the yeah. form he's, now. He's, it's like, okay, before I felt like an imposter in my life when I was, had yep. climbed the corporate ladder. And now I feel like an imposter. I'm claiming I'm a healer and yep. I've never done any of this stuff. Never done it before. Yeah. I have no idea. And please God, don't let anybody call me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll freak out. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, seriously, so I'm, I'm walking in my house and, you know, I had a landline back then. This was in 2003. I couldn't afford a cell phone. And the phone was ringing and I picked it up and this woman said, hi, may I speak to Rob, please? I'm like speaking. And she said, hi, Rob, I'd like to make an appointment. And I said, for what? And my, and my initial reaction was somebody was going to try to sell me something like life insurance or Amway or, you know, I'm like yeah, yeah. really suspicious. Yep. I'm like for what? And she said, I, I, I need to see you. I need a, I need a healing. <laughs> I'm like, um, oh, you saw my card down at the Wild Oats Market? She goes, huh? What's that? I'm like, it's the market. And she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm up in L.A. I, I, I don't even know where Long Beach is. And I'm like, so how did you get my phone number? She said, your assistant gave it to me. And I said, my assistant? And then I'm thinking, how am I going to 
cover this because I don't know what to do at this point. Yeah. So I said, oh, which one? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, that little old lady that had the white dress on and white hair and just really sweet, her. And I said, oh, yeah. And this lady said, yeah, she was really nice. I was sitting in a disabled seat in the front seat in a bus, public bus. And I was sobbing uncontrollably. And this sweet little old lady sat down next to me and put her arm around me and said, Miss, this man will help you. Please call him now. And she wow. handed her a piece of paper that had Rob and my phone number on it. And this was 30 miles or so away from the place where I put my cards up half an hour before. And so, you know, the woman said, so can I come this afternoon? <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm booked. <laughs> it's like, because I don't know. I have you no, still got to figure out like what that like get your bearings. What's I, going on? Like, who is this lady? Like, I have no idea who this lady is. Well, and I don't know who the lady is. And the lady that calls, I asked her for her name and she wouldn't even tell me her name. She's oh, like, wow. I, I won't tell you my name because you're going to try to figure out you're going to do background check on me and you're going to pretend like you're a psychic and I'm not going to let you play that game with me. So I'm not going to tell you my name or anything about me. Got it. And your assistant said, I don't have to pay you. So um, I'd like, and she said, I would see you today. So can I come today? And I was like, no, <laughs> no. And she's like, tomorrow, I'm like, no, next day, no. And I'm like, Thursday, no. <laughs> and um, I mean, I had no idea. So I said, I, we finally scheduled a time and I bought a old beat up massage table and a garage sale and got some candles and a couple of Enya CDs and, you know, made a healing room mm -hmm. at my house. And um, this woman showed up, wouldn't tell me her name. <clears throat> and I had literally put packs of Kleenex under my arms because I was sweating profusely. I was so scared. <laughs> and I mean, I had no idea, man. I had no idea. Yeah. And she, she was a really heavy lady. And I, my first thought was she's going to break my table. Uh -huh. And, you know, I started having these weird, like human reactions. And so I got her to lie down and, and I just said, okay, close your eyes and take a deep breath. And I looked up and I'm like, okay, you got me into this. <laughs> yeah. What, what, am I doing here? what do you got for me? Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was scared. I mean, I, I was petrified. And, and of course my insecurities were running wild, you know? So anyway, so all of a sudden this, this uh, spirit shows up next to her in a tuxedo and looking really sharp. And I psychopathically, you know, I said to him in my head, um, telepathically, I said, who, what are you doing here? Who are you? And he said, tell Nancy that it's her father. Mm. And so I said, Nancy, and she goes, how do you know my name? She started screaming at me and I said, cause your father's here. Wow. And she said, we just buried him two weeks ago. How could he be here? And I'm like, he's here. And this is what he has on. And he wants to talk to you. And I'm thinking, well, this is a good gig. I'm going to be a medium. You know, <laughs> I just get to stand and talk to dead people and, you know, pass on. And so we had quite the conversation her, between her dad and her. And then, this young guy pushes dad out of the way, another spirit and, and talks about how, you know, he was murdered 10 years before, but the police thought it was a suicide and Nancy had taken it all in as her fault. And she got really overweight and very depressed and all these things were happening. And, you know, that got cleared. And, you know, a couple of hours later after me crying and her crying and all this stuff happening, she left. And I just, I didn't understand. I was like, I don't understand what just happened. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. I just said, okay, let's go. And all of a sudden these spirits showed up. That was my first, my first healing. And, you know, she, she was able to release all that guilt and that she had thinking that she'd created her lover to kill himself when it actually had happened a different way. And I was given all the details. So she knew that it was accurate. And so I thought, okay, I got this now. I'm just going to be a medium. Mm -hmm. And so for the next couple of weeks, my assistant was busy around LA passing out my name. And these people were calling me. And none of my cards had ever been taken off the bulletin board at, at Wild Oats. And wow. everybody was talking about the assistant and everybody was describing her the same way. So I was getting, I was starting to understand that 
whatever I was doing was real. Mm -hmm. And because I could, I could see what was happening, how people were being led to me. And then I could see what was happening when I was with people. And, you know, over a, a matter of, of a few weeks, I started to gain some confidence, although I still was as amazed, if not more amazed than the person in my presence was of what happened. Yeah. And I'll never forget Nancy, when she walked in the door that day, she said, so you must be really busy. You must have been doing this a long time because you've got more than one assistant. Because I asked her, you know, which assistant. Yeah, yeah. which one? <laughs> and she said, how long have you been doing this anyway? And I said, oh, you're my first client ever. Wow. <laughs> and she started laughing. And I started laughing. I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, I told the truth. <laughs> so, but that's how it started. And, um, you know, and then, and then, one day I'd done my prayer and I said, God, what do you want me to do now? And and God or whoever that was speaking to me said, it's time for you to move to Sedona. And I did. Um, that's a whole nother story. I had no money and I had no credit and I had just gone bankrupt and I couldn't afford to rent a trailer, you know, but everything opened up and I got all that taken care of for me. And I realized that the reason I was in, they asked me to go to Sedona was, you know, as you know, it's a Mecca mm -hmm. uh, healing journey. It's a he healing destination. And here's this 55 year old guy that's in Sedona. So he has credibility because I'm in Sedona, right? Uh -huh. yeah. I'm a healer in Sedona. You must be good. Yep. And I'd probably worked on 10 people, you know, and, and people just started finding me in Sedona and I was there 14 months. And what I realized was happening is that God was bringing me, groups of people that all had the same uh, manifestation. So, you know, I'd see people with breast cancer for one or two days and I'd see child abuse and I'd see this and I'd see mm -hmm. that and fibromyalgia. I saw every possible uh, outcome people could have from physical to mental to spiritual to whatever. And they'd all come in groups. And then once they, the beings that were working with me figured out that I knew as much as I needed to know, they'd send a new group. Hmm. And so I would, that's how I was trained to understand. Uh, so I was trained to understand what they were doing because I wasn't doing anything. Um, I was being shown what they were doing because I said, I'll do this job, but I want to, I want to be involved. I want to understand it. Yeah. I don't want to go into a trance. I don't want to like disappear. Yeah. I want to, I, I'm not going to do anything. I just want to understand. Tell me if I ask you a question, why is my hand on her liver? You're going to tell me. So that was my my real training was in Sedona for like 14 months. I saw everything from possessions, demonic. I mean, I saw everything in 14 wow. months. And that's and from there it's uh, 300,000 people later. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. What a journey. When you look back on that is it just like wow, it's an, it's amazing that I'm here doing this right now and I I I mean I can't imagine what that's like to look back. Well, you've seen me and, you know, you've seen me in person yeah. and you see how excited I get, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm like a little kid in a magic store going, well, watch this. This is going to be really cool. Yeah. And I pull yeah. a rabbit out of a hat, and, <laughs> you know, but it's not my arm pulling the rabbit. It's well, and that, that's, that's the, that's the next question that I had is that, um, and, and of course it's kind of rhetorical because I've heard you explain it, but it's, it's important for the people watching and listening to this. Um, when you do what you do, and I can, you know, briefly describe from, from my vantage point, because I attended one of your weekend immersions, you put your hands literally on my chest and then another hand on my back. And you went around the room doing this. And the, the first time that it happened to me, the, the only way I can describe it, I'm sure other people have different explanations and different experiences is that my body, like, melted i i no longer had control of my own body when you put your hands on me and i like fell back into the seat and just began crying like crazy just just f tears were flooding out of my eyes and it wasn't anything specific that that i was like focused on it was just i, I think i intuitively knew this that for me at least it was a release of just a lot of you know trapped emotions and, and things that I had been sort of suppressing subconsciously to some degree. But 
on so on your side of things when you lay your hands on people what what is happening there so everything that i do happens really fast you know it's like you you felt it it was like yeah. that fast yeah. and so when i touch people i always touch them here because in in your energy bodies this for, and everything i say by the way is my opinion and this yeah. is what i know to be true so if you disagree with me, I, I get it. Yeah. But I was always told to put my hand here, which some cultures call your higher higher heart. Um, I refer to it as the place where your soul lives. Mm. And and so right here in this area, your soul is every experience you've ever had, everything about you from every place you've ever been is is like it's like on a hard drive in your soul. Mm. Because we we remember everything, and you know most of it's in our subconscious. But we remember our our energy body, our soul remembers every experience we've ever had, and and it also has almost like a wish list where the soul is saying, "This is what my soul is asking for in this moment." Mm. So if you remember, I didn't ask you anything. No, I didn't say what are, What are you doing here, buddy? I'm like just just take a deep breath and here we go. So one hand goes on on your soul. The other hand will go somewhere on your back, usually behind it or, or lower, just to kind of ground in the energy. And what happens in a in a split second is that I see it, but it's like you're running through a cosmic Xerox machine where there's this light that goes down your body really fast and reads everything in your body. It sends the information up to God or whatever little title you want to use. And then it comes back down split second into my hands and then it goes into your body. Wow. And that all happens like faster than you can even imagine. Hmm. And the whole purpose is to begin to break apart what people call density, hmm. you know, which is our packing our emotions down, keep packing, we keep swallowing them, shoving them down. And that's why it that's, literally feels heavy, like actually feels heavy on your body. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that density creates energetic blockages which creates stagnation, energetic stagnation. And you know what happens when you have stagnation over time, it keeps getting worse, right? Mm -hmm. And and so whatever you carried forward into this lifetime that you hadn't completed in the past or came from your lineage gets activated in that stagnation mm -hmm. and, and something occurs. And so, for example, a cancer diagnosis may occur. And what I know to be true is that it's kind of like with me, I kept getting tapped on the shoulder and, and being reminded to do something that I didn't do it. Yeah. And finally I got smacked hard enough that I did something. Mm. Well, a, a diagnosis, fibromyalgia or cancer or Crohn's disease or whatever it is, is your soul crying out to you saying, Hey, mm. let's make a change here. Yeah. And it doesn't mean go get a pill or go get a surgery. It means, Hey, Let's release some emotions. Let's change our diet. Let's change the way we think. Let's change the way we treat each other. Let's change the way we treat ourselves. And that will bring about the healing on a permanent basis where a pill or a surgery won't. And so what you felt was like a lightning strike into your body that exploded mm. this density out. And it's the density we hold on to is like a foundational energy. It keeps it holds you up, and that's why you fall down. Yeah. It's because everything has been exploded, and that opens up the pathway to start pulling out these old emotional energies from all lifetimes and from your lineage going back seven generations. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah, you know this this brings up an important thing that I've thought about quite a bit lately and my my wife Kylie and I have talked about it so much and she's starting learning so much with respect to um the manifestation of symptoms and you know her, her story to speak on my wife for a little bit um she was diagnosed with lupus rheumatoid arthritis and uh was under the care of conventional rheumatologists for quite a while for nearly 10 years and then we found Dr. Kelly Brogan by chance and and my wife did the work to sort of take that initial knowledge um and then expand upon it herself uh and and reverse both of her autoimmune conditions in a matter of three months um just by becoming more mindful and adopting 
a simple, uh, at that time for us, it was a whole 30 slash paleo diet and she reversed all of her autoimmune symptoms and she's sort of lived, um, in remission, I guess you could say, really, I don't think those things are actually real diseases, but she's lived without them now for seven years. And the the thing we're realizing now is that, you know, some of the, I don't want to speak for her, but some of the symptoms will sometimes come back up and it's, it's always in relation to stress. And we're now having our whole paradigm flipped in that we're understanding that a lot of the natural slash alternative health space has also got it wrong and is also missing the boat in that they think disease is simply a manifestation of of toxins in malnutrition and now i'm beginning to realize more and more and more it's actually yeah those those things are very important but more important and more fundamental is the suppressed emotions and trauma and negative thoughts and and not having, um, you know, coherence in one's mind, body, and soul. Can you speak to that a little bit? I, you know, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I've always said that 99.9999% of illness or disease is created by emotional toxins. So you do have toxins in your body, but they're emotional toxins. And, you know, and they sit they tend to be attracted the emotion tends to be attracted to certain organ systems so for example panic attacks uh, anxiety self-worth issues self-love issues self all those self issues rest in your in your lower back mm -hmm. and you know so so and that your kidneys is where what lives there and most people die of kidney failure mm. so i mean if your kidneys are overwhelmed with fear or, or self-worth issues or all this criticism and judgment from others or even yourself they're not functioning well and they're a vital part of your organ system and everything starts shutting down and then and then that creates opportunity for these emotional toxins to really start to grow and to take hold mm. and 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 for me if yeah, you got to probably need to change your diet. You probably should stop drinking Coca-Cola and eating Kentucky Fried Chicken every night. And maybe you should stop eating gluten or refined sugar, or maybe you should stop drinking alcohol, or maybe you should just be nice. You know, what? whatever it is, if you do things, because this work that I do is not done by me only. It's a partnership with you. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't do your part, I can help you but it won't be sustainable. So there's a lot of messages in, you know, how you let your emotions go, but then you need to support your physical body with proper food, proper water, proper all of this and proper thought. And if you have the combination of releasing the density, releasing the emotional toxins and changing your lifestyle, hmm. nothing's impossible. I've seen everything happen from that simple. I mean, it's not simple, but it is. Right. Just because you got the diagnosis, you got the car accident, you got whatever it was because you needed to wake up. And you don't need to, but you're being given the opportunity to wake up or you can not wake up, mm -hmm. suffer. And to me, I don't care what it is. It's a it's a signal that your soul is saying, hey, yeah, let's do something different here. Yeah. Symptoms are a, a messenger from the body. It's it's a really beautiful reframe then you realize the body is not making any mistakes the body's not attacking itself or anything like this it's just a messenger to alert you to something that you need to look at a little bit right? exactly yeah. yeah and so i, I want to talk now about what you know inhibits people or hinders people from having sustained healing with respect to the work that you do and i think that sort of branches out into really anything. Cause I I've asked the same question to my friend, Eileen McCusick, when I interviewed her, what, you know, she's, she does this amazing biofield tuning work and I have my sonic slider right here. I keep it on me like at all times, always using it. Um, and she talks about how she is by way of her biofield tuning, helping to, to bring the body back into a state of coherence. Right. But I asked her what, leads to people having symptoms coming back and she said something to the effect of it's their their mental attachment to that 
that feeling. It's, it's, it's all mental that they're on. It's, it's all the mental things that they're unwilling to let go. So would you say that you pretty much agree with what Eileen says with respect to that? Yeah, I would agree with, with that. I would take out the word all. Uh, <laughs> um, that was my word, by the way, not Eileen. So okay. I probably misspoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Take the word all out. Um, what I've learned over the years is that there's several components that can always that can sabotage your healing. And one of them is the most common one is that people don't have the faith and belief that they actually can heal. We've been trained as as human beings to go outside of our body, go to the doctor, get a pill, get an operation, get a diagnosis, get chemotherapy, get all this stuff and not actually let our body do the healing. You know, so so there's this belief that you can't heal. You're relying on somebody else to heal, and that that to heal you, and that always is as a failure in 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 motion, right? So that's a big one. Another one is that we we tend to claim over and over and over and over our diagnosis, our our. So like I've always had back pain. My back always hurts. I'm never going to get better. Nothing ever works for me. All those things are commands to your body that your body goes, okay. And so in addition to, you know, changing your belief about knowing that your body, I mean, you know, cut your finger, your finger heals by itself. Mm -hmm. It's not just limited to your finger. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Like Joe Dispenza says, you know, your body is the perfect pharmacy. Mm -hmm. It's got everything inside that, that you need to be healthy, but we keep going outside. Yeah. And so, so it's the belief that you need to go outside, but it's also your self, your pro proclamations, my oncologist, my cancer, my chemotherapy, my rheumatoid arthritis, my, 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 my. And every time we do that, your body goes, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. Yeah. You know, and then, then there's the whole diet diet thing which I get, I get uh, really sometimes irritated about because people have this herd mentality. If somebody says drink, you know, carbonated carrot juice, everybody runs out and gets carbonated carrot juice. And it's <laughs> only good for half the people and half the people is really bad for. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, don't just take somebody else's, you know, get a, a Kelly Brogan to do a functional medicine exam on you and <laughs> he'll tell you what's what to do. But yeah, so it's diet, it's thought, it's belief. And in a, in a, and it's a commitment. It's patience. I mean, people people want everything to go that they've been carrying for yeah. lifetimes that their great grandmother passed down to them. They want it to go like that. Yeah, that's why it's called the work, right? It's, it's not just work. a yeah. and the work never stops. Yeah. You know, people are like, "How long is this going to take, Rob? This is, this is taking too long." I'm like, "Well, at the moment of your, your conception, you were given." all of your past life stuff that you didn't complete and all of your seven generations back that you, they didn't complete. And that's a pretty big menu that you, you've got to check through and it takes time. And it's, that's why they call it to work. Like you said, mm -hmm. you know, I, when I was thinking about the title for this episode, I, I titled it lighting the spark of divine energy. And that came about when sort of contemplating the, the, the process that happens, that, that flows through you. And what I mean more specifically is you are simply igniting the spark in people. You're not, you know, and I, I think you would, you would agree with this. Um, you're not healing anyone. It's, it's something is flowing through you that is lighting the spark in someone else for them to begin the process of taking ownership of their own health and healing. Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah. And, you know, and in, in the past, I've often said, I'm, I'm the guy that relights your pilot light. Yeah. Right. So you, is that what I should change the episode? Well, title no, but I like your, I like yours better, <laughs> but you know, it's like nothing, you know, it's your, your systems don't work because your pilot lights out. So I'm going to come along and relight your pilot light, but you, have to turn the thermostat up or you have to clean the air filter or you have to have the ducts cleaned or whatever you got to do that i'm just going to light i'm going to relight you and then from there on it's up to you and and 
So that's kind of the simplistic way of saying it. And, you know, and because of our own crazy human beingness, you know, I can light the pilot light and five seconds later, you can blow it out mm -hmm. with a belief or a statement or a Coca-Cola or whatever it is. And then I can come light it again. And each time I come light it, you get better. Mm -hmm. But if you just go within and take care of yourself and, and stop looking outside for all the answers, that pilot light will bloom into a nice big flame and, or air conditioning unit or whatever you want it to be. And it'll take over. But it takes a lot of patience and a lot of work to get to the point where the flame keeps going and ignites and becomes bigger and stronger and brighter instead of going out all the time. We tend to put our own light out all the time. And you were, go ahead. Yeah. When, when I met with you in person for your week in immersion, there were several times that, you know, we would, we would do one of the sessions and we would open it up to the room and people would talk and you were so big on correcting people for any statements they would make sort of bringing into being or reigniting those old patterns. Um, can you talk to me about why it's so important to, to reframe our language and reframe our thoughts and how we go about doing that? So what I've learned over the years, um, just by observation and asking lots of questions, is that every cell in our body responds to one thing and that's our our thoughts our words it doesn't respond to your words my body doesn't respond it might respond emotionally but every mm -hmm. cell in my body listens to and says yes to whatever you say mm -hmm. so if you notice in a, a, like you saw in, in at the immersion that people would ask a question and I would, I would say, what did you just say? Mm -hmm. And they would say it again and they would say it again and they would say it again. And it's like, I'm trying to get better, but I'll never get better. Or, you know, whatever that's yeah. negative self-talk, we say it to ourselves all the time. And every cell in our body hears that vibration because words are energy, thoughts are energy, everything's energy. And every cell is going, okay, boss, that's what you want. You got it because our cells are unconditional. Mm -hmm right? God is unconditional. So if you say it in prayer, I'm never going to get better or that. And God goes, yes. Okay. I love you unconditionally. So you get everything you ask for. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And so you got to be really careful. And, and whenever you say a, a negative word, for example, if your mantra is, I don't have cancer anymore, the universe doesn't hear the word don't. The universe only hears, I have cancer. Yeah. Right. So I say to people, don't use the C word. Don't use whatever it is in your affirmation because the universe is going to delete any negative words in there. And you're going to basically say, I have cancer or I have this. Don't even say it. Don't even talk about it anymore. Talk about health. Talk about vitality. Talk about gr gratitude. Talk about, you know, joy and bliss and all those things. Because then your body's going, yeah, 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 instead of, you know, so. Yeah. Well, that brings up for me the, the, the sort of question of the necessity to name what is in, in reality versus like just looking past it. And what I mean by that is, like, is there any positive effect of like coming to terms with, okay, I have cancer, but then now what am I going to do about it? Right? Like, is, is, is there some element of necessity for, for naming what is regardless of how dark it is? Well, I think that when somebody that you respect, like a physician tells you that you have cancer, that's, that's the most important part because that's, supposed to get your attention right mm -hmm. it's so your job at that moment is to decide whether you're going to accept that person's yeah, opinion right. or not yeah and hopefully you're going to go oh crap that's not going to work for me i don't accept that i'm going to do something about this myself mm -hmm. and so i think the naming of it 
is important because it's a, it's been named to motivate you to do something different with your life. But if you keep naming it, yeah. you basically are, you continue to own it. You continue to claim it. You continue to you become it and it you overcomes it. you. Yeah. And then good luck. Right. Yeah. And so if you notice in the immersions, when people would say something like that, I would just stop them in their tracks or yeah. somebody would stand up and like, let me tell you my story about how horrible my life's been. And I've had this back pain forever. And I'm like, stop talking because we've, we've learned to label everything as not everything, but we've learned to label things that don't feel good as bad. Mm -hmm. And we tend to talk about it all the time. Yeah. Or we tend to Google about it all the time instead of changing our state, changing our energy around it. And, and saying, okay, I, I used to have back pain. My back, my back is healthy now. Mm. instead of i don't know if i'll ever get rid of this back pain or that's you know you've heard the stories yeah we all do it i do it too i mean i'm not above all this stuff and we tend to go on and on and on about what's wrong instead of being on and on and on about gratitude great how grateful you are with your life and your friends and your gifts and your blessings and you know one of the things i say all the time is that we tend to have a list of what we're grateful for, but we don't include everything. Mm -hmm. We only include, I won the lottery and I married this beautiful woman and I've got three great kids. I'm so grateful for that. We're not grateful, tend not to acknowledge being grateful for all these other experiences like I had in my life that that, that formed me into who I am now, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, so I always say that with respect to what's happened the last three years that I am so grateful for for covid i'm so grateful for the likes of you know anthony fauci and klaus schwab and all these people because i wouldn't be doing what i'm doing right now if it weren't for them i wouldn't have gone deeper into you know my understanding of health and my journey of healing and helping people understand all of this information and starting this uh show and in this organization and the previous organization i started and all these things i wouldn't have done any of that if it wasn't for this dark situation that i had experienced mm -hmm. and you know i i'm grateful for COVID too because it it brought people together in a different way and it brought people into in search of something else mm -hmm. you know it's like i don't want to go back to that old whatever that was i want yeah. I want to create something new. And that yeah. I think that had a lot, to, the energy behind it was some of it was to motivate us to do something different. Right. Amen. And instead of like going, Oh my God, we're all going to die. It's like, yeah. no, let's do something different now. Yeah. Let's change everything. Right. Yeah. And the people that did that have had amazing experiences and the people that stayed in there have had the same experiences. Yeah. And it's your choice but I know which one I'd like to choose. So, yeah. Amen. And, and speaking of choosing and, and like choosing not to, uh, you know, stick with or, or a, allow a label or a diagnosis to become your identity and overtake you and consume your life and cause you illness and all these things. You had your own experience. I don't know if you, you you're willing to go into some of the details surrounding that. Um, but you had your own experience in the last couple of years. If you want to forego discussing that, we totally can. But I think it's relevant and it's helpful to hear. I'm not sure which experience you're talking about. Well, you had your own health experience in the last oh, uh, that two one. years. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd love to talk about that because to me, you know, it, it, people go, yeah, it was you. Of course. I'm <laughs> like, no, it was I'm. I'm I'm a teacher, so I I was given a master class on diagnosis. Yeah. So what happened was that on July fifth, I'll be two years ago this July. I lived in Santa Monica. I took taking my little puppy dog out on the beach for a walk, and everything started to spin. And I started to spin, and uh, the horizon went forty five degree like that. So the ocean looked like that, and I went down. I had a stroke. A major stroke and fortunately being in Santa Monica at that time there was a lot of other people laying on the beach <laughs> for other reasons um, homeless people and people with too many drugs so I kind of joined the group so people were literally walking by me stepping over me wow you know I'm laying there <laughs> like and uh, my mom passed because of a stroke 
And so I didn't realize it was stroke at that time, but I had a, I had a suspicion that something really bad was wrong with me because I, you know, I was like spinning and vomiting and all these wonderful things. And finally somebody stopped and said, do you need some help? And I'm like, yeah. And so ambulance, blah, 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 taken to UCLA Medical Center. Neurologist said, Mr. Worgen, you know, you've had a major stroke. I showed me the MRI, showed me this dark area in my brain. Said, you know, you've got, I'm sure there's the same diagnosis they give to a lot of people. Same words, same diagnosis. You know, you're in, you're in for a long haul. You're going to be in the hospital for two to three weeks in rehab for several months. Your speech is going to be bad. You're going to have a tough time walking, blah, 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 blah. And and I and the doctor said to me, do you have any questions? And I said, no, I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. And I said, I do not accept your diagnosis. <laughs> Should have seen his face. <laughs> but that was great. But, I, but he was the head of neurology for UCLA Medical. I mean, seriously, you know, and he said, what, are you one of those kind of people? And I said, yeah, I guess so. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate your training. I appreciate your opinion. I, I know you're an amazing physician. However, I don't accept that. What I accept is I'm going to leave the hospital by the end of today. Walk out of here and not because you're sick of me and you threw me out. I'm going to stand up from this bed and yeah, I'll probably need you know a little help, but I'm going to walk out of here today by five o'clock and go home and I'm going to be fine. And I meant it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like, I don't have time for this, <laughs> you know, and I had a weekend immersion like a week later. I'm like, I can't cancel an immersion. <laughs> the healer can't be sick. So, I mean, I went through the whole day with all the tests and all the all the stuff they do to you. And I just kept saying it's two hours until five o'clock. I'm leaving at five o'clock. <laughs> And at a quarter to five, I actually bet the neurologist five dollars that I would leave by five o'clock. Of course, mm -hmm. he didn't think that was funny. But <laughs> at at like quarter to five, one of his assistants came in and discharged me from the hospital. Said there's no reason to keep you here. Wow. And I haven't had any treatment since. Um, yes, I had a walker for a couple of days because I was a little shaky for a couple of days. Um, but that was almost two years ago. And so I didn't, I didn't accept the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, my favorite parts of the movie heel that didn't get into the movie heel, but it's on my website is this lady that was told she had PLS, which is uh, aggressive also, uh, ALS, the Gerg disease. Right. And, and she says in the movie, and when the doctor said that to me, I did not accept his diagnosis wow. and she's pretty much fine. Wow. And so, and I'm more than fine. You know, I'd, I'd had some issues in my body that had been kind of bugging me for years. And after my quote stroke, they all went away. Wow. And so, you know, but I, I could have, I was in the stroke ward and I was being told all these things. I could have said, okay, I guess I'm screwed, but I didn't. And I believed it. And I was adamant about it. And I kept repeating it all day. It's only, it's almost five o'clock and I'm leaving at five o'clock mm -hmm. today. Yeah. And my body said, yes. Right. God said, yes. Um, I didn't buy into it and I could have. Yeah. And this is why the, the work that you do is so important because can you imagine I mean, I'm sure you've thought about this quite a bit, the, the number of people that are out there that receive X diagnosis, any diagnosis, and it's coming from a perceived authority figure that is supposed to, you know, all there is to know all there is to know about health, which is a conversation for another time, because we know that's not entirely true, but they receive this diagnosis and they believe it, they fully believe it and they start perpetuating it and becoming it. And then, you know, unfortunately so many people end up passing away because of it and i think it's it's really amazing that i know you said some people will be like yeah well of course rob i'm sure w you you going through this experience of course you can handle it because of your abilities but it's like i look at it in a different way that you're a human being as well just like the rest of us and this was like you know 
I look at it as God or the universe testing you to, to see if you're really about what you're teaching, right? Absolutely. And you are. That's exactly how the way I looked at it. It was a test for me yeah. to see if I, what I was saying, if I actually believed what I was telling other people, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and I do. Yeah. And it's like, look at me. Yeah. I, and I've seen it. I mean, you have, I mean, 300,000 plus, um, you know, I've seen everything and I've seen people get up that couldn't walk, get up and walk. I've seen people get up out of hospice and thrive. I've seen everything. And I've also seen people that just accept the, the whatever and accept it. And that's exactly what yeah. happens. Yeah. I had a world famous oncologist call me one time years ago, world famous. And he, he had written a book about how to heal cancer without medicine, mm -hmm. written a book. And he got diagnosed with the worst form of cancer there was mm. untreatable. And he called me and I said, boy, this is really cool, man, because you wrote the book. Now you get to add another chapter to your book. Like, yeah. you know, look at what your opportunity is. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop repeating. No, this is what's going to happen. First this, then this, then this, wow. then this, and I'm dead. And even though after I worked on him for five days in a row and he went to a hospital and had all the scans and he had zero cancer in his body. Wow. He spent the next month traveling around the country, visiting other oncologist friends to see how come the MRI and all the tests were wrong because it had never been healed before. And he knew that I hadn't been healed. Wow. So even I'm though serious. he was witnessing with his own eyes, mm -hmm. based on his expertise, that the, the the method that you taught him to to resolve this cancer what actually made the cancer go away, he still couldn't believe it. So he's he like, why is this test wrong? Yeah. And he, I'm like, dude, you wrote a book about this. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but when I wrote the book, I didn't have cancer. I'm like, well, so this is your opportunity to write the second book that said, hey, I just proved it myself. Mm -hmm. but he didn't. Wow. And he kept coming to me and he kept getting tested and he kept, you know, for a while. And I finally said, dude, you're wasting my time. You're wasting mm -hmm. your time and your money. Cause I'm not going to make, cause you keep repeating the same thing, this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And that's exactly what happened. He died exactly when he said he was going to die. Wow. And I was like, wow, but what a lesson, right? I mean, the guy <laughs> didn't even, I kept reading. I said, did you even read your own book? Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. But that's how, that's how powerful that belief is. And that's yeah. why, you know, I love Bruce Lipton's work about mm -hmm. the biology of belief because it's so powerful. Your cells do exactly what you ask them to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the power of our, our thoughts and our, our feelings when aligned to, to create our reality is like, I think it's even within the, like I said, in the alternative health space, people don't really understand the magnitude of it. I think most of the time I don't even really understand the magnitude of it unless I'm in a really clear meditative state. Um, and it, it really is like the most important thing. I remember at your weekend immersion, um, I won't name her name, but there is a lady there who it was clear she had had a stroke at one point. And she wasn't able to move her feet. And she, it was really, really difficult, really difficult to hear what she was saying. And by day two, she was moving, I think, both of her feet and she was speaking. And I remember that she was speaking out loud so the, the rest of the group could hear her. And all of us all at the same time said, oh my goodness, your voice sounds so much better. <laughs> that was really incredible to witness. And so I know you kind of touched on some of the things that you've witnessed, but could you tell me your, you know, your, your favorite experiences of, of witnessing what would be called miracles of healing? Oh man, there's been a lot. Um, the first one that comes to mind is I like things that are kind of funny, kind of mm -hmm. fun, you know, so it's not so serious, but years ago, I, I used to work in New York every month, be up there for a week or so. And, um, one day they, there was this lady I used to do small groups and this lady, this lady's name was on my appointment schedule, but she showed up and she brought her husband and she said, I, I, 
I brought my husband, I want you to work with him instead of me. And they literally carried him into the room. It took like three people to lift him up and put him on a massage table. And she said, do you mind if I stay? Because I'm sure I'll have to go to the bathroom and he won't be able to get off the table. And I'm like, sure, you can sit over there. Well, what I didn't know at the time was that the, the guy was a, a personal liability attorney, one of those ambulance chasers. I don't know if I would have been so calm if, if I'd have known that. But yeah. Um, but anyway, so he and she said he thinks this is all a bunch of bunk, but, um, you know, it's almost Christmas and he's going to hospice on Monday and this was on a Saturday. And so I just, please. And I, so I said to the guy, you know, this is your opportunity to give yourself the best Christmas present ever. You just get out of your own head. And within 10 minutes, he actually sat up on the table and started to get off the table and started walking towards the bathroom. Wow. And I said, where are you going? He said, I got to go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay. And he came back and then, you know, he left on his own. He felt great. And he went home and I said, you know, please, 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 please go home and rest. And you felt better and you felt for years. He had advanced melanoma, I think it was, and it invaded all parts of his body. And he just, you know, and that's what he was told. And I said, I know it's Christmas, but go home and just rest, sit in your favorite chair and watch, you know, Christmas movies or something. Well, he didn't do that. He went home and crawled up in his attic to get some Christmas stuff that was stored up in the attic and coming down from the attic down the steps, he fell oh, man. and rolled down the ladder and then rolled down the stairs that were at the bottom of the ladder. And so I'm smiling because it's, you know, it's a good story actually. But so they rush him to the hospital because the wife was worried that he's like broken every bone in his body and they do a full body scan. And there is no cancer in his body. None. Oh, oh. So that was, that's one of my favorites because, you know, God, God needed to prove to this guy that, you know, to believe what was possible. And he had to fall down the stairs to do that. Wow. Um, but that, that would be one of them. Um, you know, I remember also one time I was in Boston and I was working with this lady that was probably in her nineties and, I had my hands on her and all of a sudden she stopped breathing and I could feel her heart stop. And of course my human brain goes, Oh geez, they're going to, we're going to have to call the ambulance and the police are going to come and the, the headline in the Boston paper tomorrow is healer kills woman <laughs> in Marriott hotel. Oh my God. I mean, that's, that's what, yeah, of course, of course right? it would be. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? Especially um, since the mainstream it will use any excuse to try to label someone like you who they already think is pseudoscientific and a quack to, you know, say, hey, don't don't go do any of these natural approaches to healing. You know. So anyway, I I just I just said, you know, I had all this moment of fear and anxiety and stuff because I'm human. And and then I went, wait a minute, get out of that energy, get back into your sacred space, just breathe. It's all, it's all supposed to be that way. And I literally watched them interject, like pull her heart up out of her body and do something with it and gently put it back in. And as soon as it went back in her body, she went, and, and her daughter came to pick her up at the end. And I said, so your mom had a pretty good experience, but I think she's much better. And I said, why did you bring her anyway? Cause I never ask people why they're there. I don't want to hear the story. Right. I don't need to know. Cause you're usually wrong. Anyway, you got a diagnosis. That doesn't mean that's what's wrong with you. That yeah. means somebody else's opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, um, yeah, mom's scheduled for a triple bypass tomorrow at uh, some hospital in Boston. And I said, well, do me a favor. Make sure they either do a scan or whatever they do before they do the surgery and just, you know, just insist on it. And so they did. And they said, your mom doesn't need surgery. Her heart's like an 18 year old. Wow. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff I see. Yeah. And, and it doesn't happen with everybody. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the, the trick. It's like the, the other 10 people in the room, didn't have the same experience or, but they had the experience they were supposed to have. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes these miracles show up in groups so people can,
strengthen her belief on what's possible. Because if it can happen with that person with that, that had the stroke or whatever the woman had MS or whatever it was, if she can start moving around again, if, if in that state, if something great can happen, what about your migraine headaches? Couldn't they easily go away too, or whatever you have? So I mean, I mean, there's there's a there's this kind of theater that goes on that gives people the opportunity to see witness something that's undeniable, and it's meant to give them hope and strength and courage and faith mm -hmm. to keep going. It's not meant to make them feel bad because they didn't have it. It's meant to show them what's possible if they make some changes. Yeah, I could totally see where someone would go away from that and be like, oh, like, what's wrong with me? Why didn't I experience healing? But if, if again, it's all goes back to our own limiting beliefs, because if we look at that in a different way, it's like, oh, my goodness, this is possible for me as well. Wow. I am now inspired to continue on my journey of healing and no longer accepting this diagnosis. Yeah. Um, another question that I have and you know, we, we kind of talked about this before, but I think it's important to ask. Um, some some people watching or listening to this might say, well, how do we know it's not placebo? Like, how do we know that he's actually doing what we, you know, what he's claiming to be able to do? But is that even a concern of yours, placebo or not, if the end result is ultimately... I don't something? care. I don't care. I mean, I don't care whether it's the, the session they had with me the last chemotherapy session they had, the session they had with the psychotherapist, I don't care. If at some point everything breaks and they're fine, that's all that really matters, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when when I have people that, that gate, get gate, we had a lady on the Zoom yesterday, I think, that said that she had all these masses in her lungs. And she knew that doing the work with me, they were gone. And she went to the doctor and the doctor said, Wow, you know, we're, we've really advanced our work, our care <laughs> to be able to get rid of these tumors. And she said, that's right. And it doesn't, you know, let the, the doctor can take credit. I don't care. Mm -hmm. As long as the person has a, has a change, that's mm -hmm. all that matters to me. And I know sometimes it's, it's, it's a placebo effect because if you really believe it, it's going to happen, right? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, I don't. I don't, I like to hear the stories, but it's, I'm not doing the work. I'm just the, the conduit for the work. And yeah. so I'm just thrilled that it happens and I'm thrilled to hear that. I'm thrilled to hear it, yeah. but I don't go, yeah, look at me. I'm so, <laughs> yeah, no, you see yeah. yeah, no, I, you don't at all. Like not even a little bit. Um, it's funny. Cause I was talking to my dad about this. Like if I didn't already know who you were, you would have just blended into the rest of the room. And it's probably the same with me. We're just like normal Midwestern dudes. Yep. That's it. That's it. <laughs> we great. work hard. We work hard and we get a, get a job well done. That's our goal. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Rob, we, we've been going for about an hour, 20 minutes. So I have one final question for you. Okay. Um, how has this gift that you've been given shifted your perspective on, on both health and then just just life and death in general. Well, you may not know this because I'm not sure if I've ever told you this, but the job, one of the last jobs I had before I stopped being a, a CEO was running a healthcare organization. Mm. And so I was involved in life or death decisions whether to cover a certain case at the end of the quarter or not, because the earnings would be affected and the stock price would be affected and all of that would be affected. So I was on the other side of this for a big part of my career, because that's what I kind of specialized in. And, um, and I didn't like it, but I didn't, I didn't know that there was something better, right? And so it, it completely shifted. And I'm, again, I'm glad I had that experience because I understand the medical business because I was in it. And I understand why they, why they over, over diagnose you because it's a whole liability thing. They don't want to under diagnose you because then they can get sued. So they're going to give you the worst possible case. So they cover their ass. Right. And so, I mean, I learned all that stuff. So, now in this field, I understand when somebody says, this is what the doctor said. And 
I understand how the other side works as well. So it's come, I've got a good balance of understanding on both sides, but I really shifted from not, not really totally believing in that the Western medical model to really totally believing in this, what I do model. So that's totally shifted. Um, the other thing is that I've worked with so many people that have had death experiences and I've had a couple of my own uh, and it's always, the reports are always the same. It's like when, when you leave, it's, it can be the most beautiful experience you'll ever have. And so I'm not afraid of it anymore. And I, I try to help people, even though they, I know they're going to pass to be as free of their stuff as they can be. So when they like move through that space, they're not encumbered by regret and remorse and pain and suffering and all those things, they can smoothly transition and uh, go on to the next, next exciting event. Mm -hmm. The next experience. Yeah. Next experience. Uh, I actually have one more question if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, you, when, when you were a kid, you were, were doing this thing with animals and praying over them. And so it was, it was coming from a, you know, traditional Lutheran Christian background with, within the context of prayer, but nonetheless still praying over something and seeing healing happen. And I, uh, I interviewed another guy named Vinnie Tolman who had what's called an after death experience. So that's like a subset of the near death experience community that they're legally pronounced dead. So he was zipped up in a body bag, um, rigor mortis already setting in the body, no pulse, no breath, um, body completely stiff and cold and was subsequently revived. But, um, when he was in the afterlife, when he was in heaven experiencing that he was being guided by his guide named Drake and Drake suddenly gave him a hug and said, this is going to be tough, but it's time for you to go back now. And what brought him back to his body uh, was his brother praying over his body in the hospital. So can you touch on as, as a final question and answer the, the power of prayer and intention? Yeah, I, I think it's very powerful. However, it's how you do it that makes it powerful in my in my in my opinion right so i i like to refer back to the ancient way of praying of prayer prior to organized religion and that was your prayer is actually a prayer of gratitude for perfect health so i'm grateful that my cousin vinnie is is revived in perfect health not please help my please help my cousin vinnie uh, because help my cousin Vinny doesn't bring it forward into the present. It's ask, it's putting it outside of you instead of bringing it into you with gratitude. So my prayer is every time I work with somebody is I'm, I'm grateful for the perfect health that this person or the perfect energy this person is receiving now. Mm -hmm. That's my prayer. And it doesn't sound like a prayer, but you saw in my immersion, I had Devon do a, a she would, I'd ask her to pray us into the session and there wasn't asking for anything. It was claiming what she was grateful yeah. for and claiming what was true. Yeah. And to me, that's the most powerful prayer, mm. not please help me, God. Um, it's like, what does that mean? I was like, I'm grateful God for my healthy body mm. in this moment. Thank you. To me, that's about as powerful as it gets because you're bringing it into the present moment you're not asking for it to become, you're not asking for something that may or may not happen in your, in your mind and you're grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is the prayer that I, that I use. And I, it's very powerful. Yeah. Hey, very so, powerful. Hey, so it is prayer rather than a, please let it be prayer. It's, exactly. It's, it's bring, bring, it, it right now. bring it to the moment, bring it right to you and be grateful for it. Yeah. And don't beat around the bush. Don't tell your story. It's like, I'm grateful for my perfect health right now. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Rob, I appreciate you so much. Say, say again. Sorry. I said, I'm grateful for you right now. I'm grateful for you. This is, this is awesome. This has been an incredible discussion. Um, I am, I am doing a weekend immersion this weekend. If anybody's interested, it's, it's a, on zoom, it's three days. It's 11 hours of, 
fun and excitement and healing and witnessing things happen. And uh, it's it's uh, it's all Zoom, and you get a you get a recording of it, so you can listen to it as many times as you want. So beautiful. Something of interest, I'll pop on my website and look for it. But it's a weekend, uh, the May weekend immersion, starting Friday. Awesome, and, and you do these pretty frequently, correct? So. Yeah. Okay. And they, anyone can, that's interested can find the details at robwergen.com. Yeah. Just go on. Uh, you can go on my calendar. It's on the calendar. You can just click on healing to healing events and it'll be on there. It's pretty easy to find, but it's, it's, it's really powerful because it's, it's Friday afternoon, Saturday for four hours, Sunday for three hours, and then a follow up. So you get really concentrated, um, healing energy for three days in a row. And uh, it, I, that, that, those weekend immersions, as you saw, create lots of miracles and big changes yeah. in people. So it's very cool. And it's, it's really expensive. It's $99. So <laughs> yeah, super, super expensive. Really expensive, right? 11 <laughs> hours and you get worked on directly. I mean, it's not like you're it, everybody in, when, when I work, everybody's getting individual work we didn't get to talk about that but everybody has their own direct line of energy coming from god that's coming through me so it's not like blanketed one size fits all it's it's um it's everybody gets individual and blanketed so it's mm -hmm. a double hit it's really cool well a quick point on that that relates back to a previous episode that i did veda austin talks about how when you are when you bring one cup of water back into coherence it can affect the other cups of water around it and actually change the structure of that water and it's shown her experiments and also yep. Gilbert Ling and yep. um, Gerald Pollock have shown this as well. So it quite literally changes the physiology of others when you're healing and working on one individual. Well, remember that we're mostly water, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's a great example. It's like what happens with one happens with all of us because that vibration changes the, the vibration, the frequency of the water in your body, which is what, 78% or something like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, it's yeah. very, it's very cool. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I cannot recommend Rob's uh, weekend immersions enough. And Rob, it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I've thoroughly enjoyed this. And if you liked this episode, please go check out Rob's website. I'm sure for the way forward, you will, you'll be seeing more of him. We'll probably do some things in the future coming up. So Rob, you're a blessing brother. So Thank grateful you. to know you. you. Same to you, Alec. So grateful to be here, everybody. So have, have a great weekend and uh, maybe I'll see you this weekend on the immersion. Awesome. Thanks y'all. All right. Take care.